What goes up? Boy, Marie! Boy, Marie! No, did it? I buy strictly American. <laughs> Time now for spinning my dad's vinyl. He, with all his skips, scratches, and pops, is my dad, Frank Baccarello. Thanks, sweetie. Thank you for tuning in to episode 199 of Spinning My Dad's Vinyl. Most of the albums so far in my father's collection were of popular artists from the U.S., This record is the first of four my dad had from an orchestra leader who reportedly was from England, featuring a trumpet player who reportedly has the same name as the guy who writes all the liner notes for the orchestra leader. (laughs) Meanwhile, there were a number of musicians who really recorded this album. Who they were is a budget record label mystery. So... Get ready to hear some pretty melodies while you're having your afternoon crumpets in Volume 199, Tea and Trumpets.
It's the Stanley Applewaite Orchestra featuring Roy Freeman on trumpet with If I Had a Love That Loved Me. Now, this is one of the many tunes from this disc that I could not find the composer of. Okay, why this record for this episode? Well, I don't think my dad was much of a tea person unless you count Arnold Palmer's. I'm also not sure he ever had a crumpet in his life either, but we know he was a trumpet fan, and he was a fan of budget record labels. We've played plenty from Pickwick and their subsidiary labels in earlier shows. This is the first of four we are playing from the band leader Applewaite, and as we'll find out, maybe another illusion created for this label. But these were song titles I was not familiar with, although we all should be familiar with one of the melodies coming up. Even the song titles within the three medleys on this disc were unfamiliar, and I'll play two of those, starting with this one.
There is a medley of Darling, My Heart is Yours, one of those songs I have no idea who the composer is, Standing in the Rain, written by Sammy Fain and Irving Cahall, and Sing Nightingale Sing, written by Bob Iller, Bruno Balls, and Michael Jerry. Now let me tell you about my dad's vinyl I am spinning for this episode. Stanley Applewaite and Roy Freeman. Stanley Applewaite plays tea and trumpets featuring Roy Freeman. It's on the Design Records label, number DLP40. It's a vinyl LP format, released in October of 1957, and its genre is pop. We will hear six of the seven songs from this album. Uh, The other medley on it has a terrible skip in it. I'm going to read a large portion of the liner notes. However, I think this narrative is blended fiction, as I was not able to find a town in England called Sheffordshire, unless there was a typo on all four albums and they meant Staffordshire, nor was there a symphonia for the real city of Norton Green, and I'll explain more in the bio section. And this was written by Roy Freeman. Design Records is very proud to present the first American recordings of one of England's most talented and versatile composer-arranger-conductors. Stanley Applewaite has conducted some of the finest and most popular orchestras on the continent and has a reputation second to none as an arranger of popular and semi-classical music. Born in Sheffordshire in 1925, this young pianist made his professional debut at the local music hall at the tender age of nine. He played piano and recited The Ballad of Lower Ipswich, a 20-minute long piece of saccharine prose written by his great-uncle Harry Applewaite. The short selection he played on the piano was met with enthusiastic cheers. The long dissertation about the problems of a horse car man in Lower Ipswich was greeted with nothing but a dull lull. It was at that moment that young Stanley decided that music was a far more satisfying life than reciting, acting, or even following in his great uncle's footsteps and writing. All of the songs have been specially arranged to show off the smooth trumpet stylings of my namesake Roy Freeman. I don't think that I will ever get over the shock that I got when I was sitting in the control room at the Sussex Studios where this album was recorded and after hearing this beautifully haunting strain echo through the microphone into our booth, I asked for the name of the trumpet player. That's Roy Freeman, Stanley said. Sure, I said, and I'm Harry James. Sure enough, one of England's finest trumpet men has my name, or I, his. After the session, Stanley, Roy, and myself had tea at the Savoy Hotel, and it was decided that the name was mine because I'm older by two years than he is. (laughs) It was also while we were having tea that afternoon that this album was named. The analogy between tea and crumpets was too much for us not to adapt. Now about Roy Freeman. A student of Maurice Fitzwarren of the Royal Farnsworth Orchestra School. Roy Freeman has received recognition from all of England's music critics for the fine mellow tone he achieves on his instrument. Notice the control on the unusual opening passages of Moritat. The real qualities of the low register vibrato. Shades of Bobby Hackett. This is an album to be played and relaxed to. We're just going to leave that there for now. We'll circle back. All right, let's see what prices this record is being sold at on Discogs.com. Only sold three times. $7.25 high, actually $10 Canadian, $1.75 low, which gives it a $3.73 average. It was last sold on February 25th, 2023 for the $2.19 median or $1.99 euro. I found a copy on eBay for $12 and nothing on Amazon. Now, my dad's album is in poor condition. I'm not sure why it sounds as if the needle is digging into the record. I've got it on the lightest counterweight possible, and the discs that I've digitized after, after this one, they sound just fine, so it's not the needle in the cartridge. There are lots of pops and crackles, and like I said, a big skip on one song that I'm not playing. There are lots of little scuffs and other marks, on the surface. The cover is surprisingly good 
for my dad with an album that old. The normal stress marks are there just from being in a stack like this for too long. No wear or tear on the edges at all. And the word posted is stamped on the back next to the green magic marker streak and a pencil check mark. He has three address labels on the front cover all stacked on top of each other. He most likely bought this while he was still living at home with his parents. I'm pretty sure the bottom address label was the first house on Fairgrounds Road that my parents bought after they got married, and the other two are the house where he eventually lived for 55 years. So I will value my dad's vinyl at a buck. Next up, what did my dad always tell me? Mind your P's and Q's.
There is Please, written by Leo Robin and Ralph Ranger. Now, I've already mentioned that I think the conductor and featured trumpet player on this album are fictitious. So I had a conversation with ChatGPT about it, and here's what AI had to say. Stanley Applewaite seems to be a somewhat mysterious figure in music history. While he is credited as a conductor and band leader on several albums released on the budget labels Pickwick and Design during the 1950s and 1960s, there is scant biographical information available, which has led to speculation that he may be a fictitious artist or pseudonym, a common practice for such labels at the time. Pickwick Records, in particular, was known for using session musicians and inventing artist names to lend credibility to their budget releases. Some sources, including Discogs, list Applewaite as the conductor for albums like All the Things You Are, featuring the music of Jerome Kern, released in 1957. However, these labels often used anonymous or fictional artists, which complicates verifying Applewaite's real existence beyond these album credits. The book, Conductors and Composers of Popular Orchestral Music, mentions that Stanley Applewaite was supposedly born in Shepherdshire, England, and had a professional career as a pianist before transitioning to composing and conducting. However, there is little corroborating evidence outside of this mention, and no detailed information such as birth and death dates is readily available. This leads to the likelihood that Applewaite may have been a pseudonym for a group of session musicians or even a marketing creation of the record label themselves. In summary, while Stanley Applewaite is credited on multiple albums, the lack of verifiable biographical details and the practices of the labels he worked with suggests a strong possibility that he may not have been a real person. However, without more concrete evidence, it remains an open question. It's also highly likely that the trumpet player Roy Freeman could also be fictitious. This suspicion arises from several patterns common with the budget labels which we have just gone over. Given that the author of the liner notes shares the same name as the trumpet player, it's plausible that Roy Freeman was used as a generic or made-up name to lend credibility to the album. Similar cases have been noted with these budget labels where artists' names were sometimes fabricated or altered to avoid paying royalties or to present albums as featuring well-known performers, even if they did not. Since there is no readily available biographical information on a trumpet player by the name of Roy Freeman in credible music archives or databases, it's reasonable to question his existence as an actual performer. This, coupled with the fictitious nature of some of these recordings and artists, suggests that the trumpet player Roy Freeman could indeed be another example of a fictional persona crafted for marketing purposes. It's like they knew you wouldn't be fact-checked in the mid-1950s, especially about an artist from the other side of the pond. <laughs> okay, here's a melody you should recognize.
Moritat, written by Kurt Vale and Bertolt Brecht. Of course, you should be familiar with the version with lyrics made popular by Louis Armstrong and Bobby Darin. A Moritat is a medieval version of the murder ballad performed by strolling minstrels. In the Three Penny Opera, the Moritat singer with his street organ introduces and closes the drama with the tale of the deadly Mackie Messer, or Mac the Knife. Time now for this episode's interesting side note. And it has to do with the fact that the record company lied to us, I think. In past episodes, I've talked about budget labels making up the name of orchestra leaders or musicians. But this was the first one I came across that had a backstory. So I continued the conversation with ChatGPT. It's entirely possible that the record label would have created a fictional backstory for Stanley Applewaite, especially given the practices of budget record companies in the mid-20th century. These labels were known for producing sound-alike records and budget albums with minimal investment in artist promotion. Often they would invent artists, use pseudonyms, or credit session musicians under fictitious names to avoid legal or financial complications, like paying them. Creating a detailed backstory for a fictional conductor like Stanley Applewaite, complete with a British origin story and a narrative about his uncle being a poet, would not have been outside the realm of possibility for these labels. It could add an air of authenticity or exoticism to the albums, making them more appealing to buyers. As Applewaite was supposedly from England, it would indeed have been more difficult for American audiences at the time to verify his credentials or existence. Information was not as readily available as it is today, and unless someone was willing to dig deep, especially internationally, they likely wouldn't question these details too closely. This plausible deniability made it easier for labels to fabricate or embellish the backgrounds of performers. Given the minimal regulation over budget labels and the relatively low profile of these albums, it's also likely that few people would have cared enough to investigate whether Applewaite was real. Many consumers probably viewed these records as inexpensive entertainment and didn't worry much about the veracity of the artist's credits. In short, the creation of a backstory would have added a layer of credibility to the marketing and the difficulty of verifying overseas origins could have shielded the label from scrutiny. This practice, especially in the context of Pickwick and design, makes it quite likely that both Stanley Applewaite and Roy Freeman were entirely fictional constructs. Hmm. So, who knows who we're actually listening to on this album. Okay, here's the second long medley I told you about that's on this record.
that medley was made up of You Make This World Beautiful. I have no idea who composed that. Virginia Blues, written by Ernie Erdman and Fred Meinken. And Two Hearts in May, written by Michael Jerry. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. I think the research rabbit hole I went down was just as much fun as listening to the music on this album. I did want to call out the image on the cover, which was photographed by Philip Lustig. It's a woman seated and staring straight at the camera with a butler standing slightly behind her. He's got a trumpet in his hands and she's holding down the middle valve as if ready for tea to be poured from the bell into the fine china teacup she's holding in her other hand. Very noticeable. This was different from the other budget label records we've listened to in my dad's collection. Only one of the songs on here was even a hit, let alone there being any standards off it. That's not the usual fare for these types of compilation discs. We usually know most of the music on the records, if not the person who performed it, but that's not the case here. Overall, though, it was pleasant music, although maybe a little bland, but that's what makes listening to my dad's vinyl collection so cool. You never know what you're going to hear. And now I think it's fitting to end the show with a song written by another and real trumpet player.
John and Julie, written by Eddie Calvert. And there you have selections from an orchestra leader who was probably made up, as was the name for the featured horn player. So thanks for tuning into Volume 199, Tea and Trumpets, however you did. If you want more information about this show, head over to spinningmydadsvinyl.com. I'll be back next week with all my skips, scratches, and pops for another milestone, Volume 200, Frank's Earworms, Take Two. Until then, go with the flow, my friends. <laughs>